Hey everybody. So before we switch topics and get into some of the molecular basis uh, of the gene and the biochemical basis of heredity, uh, we get a chance to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that really is pedigree analysis. Uh, I love pedigree analysis because it is so fundamental to contemporary human genetics. And I guess just as a personal note, one of the things that I really like about it is the fact that it sounds so simple and family relationships, especially among human beings, uh, are so important to us and they are apparently so simple and yet we find as we begin to delve further and further into the topic, we find just how complicated uh, they can be. And of course, one of my favorite cartoons. You'll notice I use a lot of cartoons because I think it's a clever way to talk about some uh, interesting topics and a great way to present it. So why do we do pedigrees? Well, pedigrees are available to us and have been developed over the years because the bottom line is controlled matings are difficult to do with human beings. Well, not just human beings, but all sorts of domestic animal species. If you take into account, for example, cattle and cattle breeding, it becomes extremely difficult to track on the basis of simply doing Punnett squares. In fact, most cattle are bred within families. And so we find, for example, among the hundreds of thousands of dairy cattle that are in the United States, they can all be tracked back to approximately seven individual sires. So seven sires contribute to the genotypes of hundreds of thousands of granddaughters and great-granddaughters that provide milk for all of us, and milk products, obviously. So uh, we can't always do Punnett squares. Matings are not always controlled. Uh, but we do have the issues in especially human beings, but also dog and small pet breeding, the idea of small families. If we think about human families, uh, 20 kids is a lot, and that tends to be some of the larger ones. The other part of it is humans don't like to have their matings controlled. They are totally uncontrolled. And as you'll see, one of the issues with doing pedigrees is that there's a difficulty in truthfully identifying parentage. And those of you who like to stream during the pandemic know if you've watched House MD, uh, the lead character says everybody lies. And in fact, we find uh, there's quite a bit more uh, untruthfulness in pedigrees than sometimes we may like to imagine. So I like to think of where the name pedigree came from, if you think uh, etymologically. Uh, it actually comes from the French, Pierre de la Grue. Uh, Pierre de la Grue means the crane's foot. And you can see, oops. You can see how the crane's foot looks very, very much like the existing pedigrees. Of course, these are very, very simple pedigrees that we have here. What do you need to know to be able to do a pedigree? You need to know the basic symbols. Symbols are easy, males are square, females are round, filled in figures are affected, and unfilled are unaffected. We have individuals that are of unknown sex, have a di diamond shape, and any individuals that are deceased within the pedigree have a slashed line through them. There are also a couple of others. Uh, we indicate matings by a horizontal line between a male and a female. One of my all-time favorites is consanguinous matings, and this is a double line between two, that would be yeah, a double line between a mating. Uh, 
Uh, consanguinous, of course, from con, same, sang, sanguine, blood, same blood. These are related individuals, okay? You'll find that there are lots and lots of these in human pedigrees. Uh, more than you might expect, by the way. Also very common in domestic animal breeding because we try to breed individuals with like phenotypes and there's a high probability that individuals having a like phenotype also have a like genotype. Note that we see an intersecting vertical line to the horizontal mating line indicates progeny. These are below. And the key element, of course, in progeny is this arrow because pedigrees are a story that are told from the perspective of a single individual. And so very often there's an arrow indicating the individual for whom the pedigree is being created, sometimes indicated by an I, meaning individual, or by the letter P, which is for proband, proband, that is the patient. Here are some great looks at old pedigrees. Uh, these are pedigrees that were formed in the early 1900s, and you can see sometimes people didn't like the right angles and recognize the complexity of human pedigrees. Uh, also, you'll notice uh, this particular one here from 19, uh, actually 1911, and uh, it's a little difficult to see, but if you go to the slide set that's posted on Piazza, you'll be able to actually investigate this much more closely. And you'll notice that there are multiple sets of symbols used, and they are all sorts of strange things, criminality, uh, sex offenders. Uh, there are also artistic elements presented in here, sculptor, musician. So pedigrees have the unfortunate history of having been involved in many of the eugenics efforts in uh, our past culture, and especially in the United States. Many of these came out of the Cold Spring Harbor labs uh, and involved, uh, even involved our buddy Thomas Hunt Morgan uh, in the early, early 1900s. And there's a great video, which will be assigned on Piazza for you to look at and to watch. And you'll see the relationship of a hospital not too far from Stockton that was involved in the early eugenics movement. So take a, keep an eye out for that. It'll be up in the next day or so. So what do we do with pedigree analysis? And critically... Uh, what we're really looking for is to determine the mode of inheritance. We want to determine the, the relative amount of dominance for a particular phenotype and putative gene. We want to understand whether it is sex-linked or autosomal. Sex-linked, of course, meaning on the sex chromosome. This could mean the X chromosome, of course, uh, in the mammalian species, the Z chromosome in birds. We want to determine if it is a sex-limited phenotype. That is a phenotype that is limited to one sex or the other. We've already talked about a milk production briefly. And of course, milk production is sex-limited. It only occurs in females. So a lot of sex-limited traits uh, are really relevant to a dairy production. How do you measure milk production in those seven sires we talked about? And the answer is you don't. What you do is you measure the milk production of their daughters and granddaughters to estimate what genes those sires have. A very interesting case of the relationship of sex to inheritance are sex influence genes. These are genes that have one mode of inheritance in one sex and the opposite mode of inheritance in the other. For example, it can be dominant in males, recessive in females. So really a very, very different mode of inheritance, usually influenced uh, by hormonal systems. 
We also have a maternal effect, and there are a couple of different maternal effects. This could be the function of something special in the milk, in the eggs, in the class mammalia or the class aves. Uh, also, we have mitochondrial inheritance because, as you know, uh, the ovum contains probably 97% of the total my mitochondria in the resulting zygote and the resulting organism that develops from the zygote. Finally, once we know the mode of inheritance, the purpose of pedigree analysis is to determine the probability of having affected offspring for any given mating pair. We will find when we talk a little bit later on in the semester when we when we discuss genetic counseling, not only do we want to know what the probability of having affected offspring are, but rather the probability of having an individual that is heterozygous and in the ver common vernacular, not a very scientific term, we talk about carriers, okay? That is those individuals that are heterozygous for a recessive deleterious trait. And we'll see that that's important a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, how not to pedigree. Here is a terrible picture of a pedigree actually published in genetics with a lot of numbers and irregular lines and nothing is very, very well established here. Notice males are not indicated by squares, although they do have uh, the Aries shield and spear, and of course Venus's mirror indicating the female, so kind of an interesting one. You don't want to have a messy looking pedigree. Typically, we want to look at, here is a classic autosomal dominant pedigree. In this case, we've got uh, We've got two individuals, an unaffected male and affected female. We know that the female is dominant. I'm showing you this now so you can recognize the... Uh, hold on one sec. Sorry about that. Uh, in this case, we look at individuals one and two, which are the progeny of the two parents above here. And we have two possibilities. One is, and if you just do a little simple Punnett square, one is that there's a half a chance the individuals could be heterozygous and half a chance they could be homozygous recessive. Since these individuals are unaffected, we know that the uh, half chance of being homozygous recessive. Of course, we can also calculate what the probabilities would be if they themselves had children. And here we see this individual one gets, has children with a homozygous recessive individual. And we see that then there's a three quarter chance that they are recessive homozygous and one quarter chance affected. How did we figure this out? Well, there's a 50% chance this individual is heterozygous. So if it's 50% here, we know that this individual, then that mating has a 50-50 chance of being either heterozygous or homozygous recessive. And so half of a half is a quarter. So there's a quarter chance of being affected. Of course, if the individual is homozygous recessive, when mated with another homozygous recessive, there's zero chance of the individual three being affected. So this is a way that we can use our conditional probabilities. You can do the same calculations for an autosomal recessive individual, and here we see the same type of calculations that one might make. Uh, in this case, unaffected outsiders are assumed to be homozygous normal, and consanguineous matings are really typical and easy to see in recessive pedigrees. Not always, but very, very often.
when we look at dominant versus recessive pedigrees, there are a couple of key elements. First of all is if two affected individuals have an unaffected offspring, it must by definition be a dominant pedigree. Alternatively, if two unaffected individuals have affected offspring, it's a recessive pedigree. In each of these cases, what we are really looking for is the possibility of finding a naturally occurring heterozygote mating between parents and looking at the resulting offspring. So really the key element is to look through a pedigree and identify families where you have two heterozygotes and looking at how many offspring they actually have. Now, of course, another possibility in thinking about a dominant pedigree is this key element. It is not always true, but often true, is if every affected person has an affected parent. So you look at a pedigree, the bigger the pedigree, the more true this is. If every affected person has an affected parent, it is a dominant pedigree. Ultimately, and you can take a peek at a more complete description in the slide sets, how do we assign genotypes for a dominant pedigree? Also, how do we assign genotypes for a recessive pedigree? And the key things to read here when you go through the slide sets is to look at the outsider rules. What we've really done in those couple of slides where we talked about probabilities is talked about conditional probabilities. And the conditional probabilities from our cartoon probability slide set is really boiling down to this bottom line here, is understanding the and or, hold on one second, the phones are ringing off the hook this morning. Sorry about that. The phone keeps ringing this morning, and somehow I forgot to mute them. Sorry. So the point of the conditional probability is really right here in this last portion right here is combine probabilities by using the and and the or rules. And if you don't recall them, let me remind you, because these are very important to keep in the back of your mind. Anytime a statement is this probability and this other probability, the way you combine probabilities is to multiply. As long as the two events are independent, you don't need to consider anything else. Just multiply the probabilities. In general, this is usually, if not always, true in pedigree analysis. This and this multiply the two probabilities. However, if it is this or this, probability A or probability B, again assuming that they are independent, then you can assume that you add the probabilities, and we'll see an example of that in just a moment. Here, of course, is an example where one half, if you recall from the previous, a few slides back rather, one parent has half a chance of being cap D small d and half a chance of being small d small d. There are two possibilities, the two homozygotes or a heterozygote and a homozygous. So there's half a chance that in the case of being homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, all offspring will be affected, whereas there's half a chance with the mating of cap D small d or the heterozygote with homozygous recessive, and half the offspring are affected. So what we do is we say half times one plus half times a half, of course, equals three quarters. So really it's pretty simple. Uh, you just have to 
watch carefully the language in the problem. If it's an AND, you multiply. If it's an OR, you add. Here's another example. This is a little bit more complicated. In dealing with a recessive pedigree, same kind of a mating, okay? However, we've got an individual with half a chance of being cap R, cap R, half a chance of being heterozygous. The other parent has a third of a chance of being cap R, cap R, and two thirds of a chance of being cap R, small R. Why one third, two thirds? Because in their mating, remember, anything that is homozygous, small r, will not be affected, okay? Will not be affected. So this goes back to our black and white pellage color example. The very first Punnett square we did is remember that it's one third and two thirds. And so you can see the math here. It's a half times a third, half times two-thirds, half times one-third, half times two-thirds. But of course, in the first case, no offspring affected because cap R, cap R. Cap R, cap R times cap R small r. Again, no offspring affected. Same thing with the reciprocal mating. Only in the final case is there a possibility of having affected homozygous recessive offspring. And so if you follow the math, it's 0 times 0, uh, rather 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 twelfth. So the answer is 1 twelfth. So it's a little more complicated with the recessive pedigrees because you always have to remember that black and white pellage problem where the chances of these individuals being homozygous recessive are, are homozygous cap R rather is one third, whereas two thirds chance of them being heterozygous. It's a little bit more difficult. Just to give you a sense of how complicated pedigrees can be, I've got a couple examples here. Here's one for microcephaly. Again, you can follow the full slides along with the slide set on Piazza. Here's one of my favorites. This is absolutely my favorite. Here's Cleopatra down here, and notice the pedigree on her mother's side. Please notice all of these double lines indicating consanguineous matings. Here's half-brother and half-sister having two children. The two children, full brother and full sister, actually have a child, and of course, this mating here has three offspring, of which we have a full brother, full sister, who of course have a child, and then it's uncle, niece, who have a family, and then those two full brothers and full sisters have Cleopatra's mother, Cleopatra Berenike III. So really a fun pedigree. Family dinners must have been wonderful back then. Of course, things are very different because this was the pharaoh lineage, and of course, royalty could only ever marry royalty in that case, and it was a very restricted group of individuals, but nonetheless fun. These days, uh, computer analysis really has taken over pedigrees. It's no longer necessary to draw them by hand. Uh, there are a couple of things that you should remember. When looking to find the inheritance of particular phenotypes or particular traits in human beings, the go-to website is Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, O-M-I-M dot org. Uh, it is a phenomenal uh, website and a phenomenal database that has been fully integrated in all of the human genome and proteome databases. So really a great place to go to look to see if you want to find the inheritance of any simply inherited phenotype in humans, whether it's a morphometric phenotype or a disease phenotype. Great place to start. If you want to draw a pedigree, there are a handful of easy-to-use 
drawing programs available. The one I recommend for most undergraduates is Haplo Painter. Haplo Painter is free. It is open source software, and you can get it at haplopainter.sourceforge.net. One that's a bit more complicated is Madeline, and it's actually Madeline 2.0 right now. Uh, it is maintained by the University of Michigan. Uh, their uh, ophthalmology group at the University of Michigan has a great reputation for studying diseases of the eye, genetic disease disorders of the eye, and they have a fantastic pedigree program, but it's a little more difficult to use. And finally, there is the professional pedigree program uh, known as Progeny Genetics. Progeny Genetics has a free online pedigree drawing program. The professional version costs uh, several thousand dollars a year to use. It's an annual license and generally used by genetic counselors and uh, OBGYNs uh, who also do genetic counseling. It is a phenomenal program. It is the industry or professional standard for doing genetic counseling because it is fully integrated with online Mendelian inheritance in man and the human genome and proteome databases and is really a pleasure to use. Uh, I used to use it in my previous life at Penn State. However, the cost has just become exorbitant and uh, I can't really justify spending the money uh, for a small portion of uh, our genetics class. But really a treat. Uh, if some of you are interested in genetic counseling, that's certainly uh, a software program that you'll become familiar with. And that really brings us to the close of our conversation about pedigrees. If you have any questions, please post them. Call uh, either email, I was going to say call me, email me, or post it right under on Piazza. Take care, stay safe, and uh, be talking to you again soon.